Okay, well, we were due to begin at half past six. We're due to finish no later than eight. So I thought, you know, we need to start to get it kicked off. Um, can I first say thank you and welcome to those who managed to join us on this last night of conference. And for those of you who were at the CWU party last night, a double congratulations <laughs> for managing to get here. Yeah. Um, it's always a bit of a bash. I didn't get there myself, I'm a bit more disciplined, but anyway, thank you for coming. A bit disappointed about the numbers, but I'm sure the quality of the audience will be just as good, so thanks to you. My name's Carolyn Jones, I'll be chairing the Fringe. It is a joint fringe between the Institute of Employment Rights and the Campaign for Trade Union Freedom. Two organisations with a very long and proud history of defending and promoting employment rights and trade union freedoms. And what a time for us to meet. If ever there was a need for a new deal for workers, it is surely now. Trade unions are still struggling under some of the most restrictive laws on trade unions in the Western world. And that trust has stepped into his Thatcher time machine and wants to rerun the battles of the 80s with yet more restrictions on trade unions, on trade union action, on trade union rule books, and on trade union funds. And at the same time, workers are still struggling against archaic working practices like zero-hour contracts, fire and rehire threats, or in p and case, fire and replace tactics. p and if you remember, cut out of the rehire bit, made 800 workers redundant by Zoom and replaced them with cheap labour, which is suggested was as little as £2 an hour. And all in the media spotlight, the chief executive of P&O admitted to a House of Commons committee that the company had broken the law. But I'll leave Andy MacDonald to talk about that, uh, as I'm sure he will. The fact that P&O could get away with that reflects the dire straits of the UK's framework of labour laws. And instead of challenging that breach of the law, the Tories instead moved to the goalposts in the summer, they amended the regulations covering the use of agency workers and made it legal for employers to use agency workers to replace strikers engaged in official strike action. It's a scabs charter and it needs to be challenged. Which is why both the Institute and CETUF are pleased that a number of unions have got together and launched a joint legal challenge to the controversial changes to the agency worker regulations. But, as history tells us, it won't be the courts that save trade unions. It won't be labour law that protects working people. And it won't be politicians who ride to our rescue and apologies to the lawyers and the politicians on the platform tonight. As the current wave of strikes and collective action shows, it will be workers and their trade unions, the organised working class, who will demand the changes that are needed. That's why it's so important to remember and celebrate past struggles and learn the lessons from our history. This year is the 50th anniversary of the Pentonville Five. Five dockers shop stewards who were imprisoned in July 1972 by the National Industrial Relations Court for refusing to obey a court order to stop picketing. And I should point, I said we had a proud history of uh, within our organisation. Vic Turner, one of the dockers, uh, was president of, uh, to a seat, seat of, um, uh, a predecessor which was a uh, reclaim our rights under the wonderful Bob Crow. So we do definitely have a long and proud history. Anyway, back to Pentonville. That battle wasn't just about picketing, important though that issue was. The case of the Pentonville Vive was the culmination of a battle against the Anti Union Industrial Relations Act introduced by the Conservative government of Ted Heath. The Tories, much the same as now, were on a mission to smash trade unions and trade union action. But the arrest and imprisonment of the five dockers led to the calling of a general strike by the TUC. And within days, the five were released. So we need to learn the lessons of our past, even if our tactics today would be different. The point is, Workers United can and do win. Solidarity and un unity using our biggest power, which is our numbers, to protect our rights and freedoms will deliver results. 
The Tories are in government, but we are six million strong as a trade union movement. We create the wealth, we keep the country running, we provide the services that people depend on. So we are pleased to see the growing industrial unrest spreading across the UK, across many sectors, uh, and reflecting the anger and the frustration felt by so many workers. And we're not alone. I was reading just this morning about forthcoming strike October uh, in, in the USA, with increased walkouts amidst a surge in union growth and activity. So, you know, it's not just happening here, it's happening in other parts of the world. So to discuss those issues tonight, we have an excellent platform of speakers, uh, and I will move to introduce our first one, who is Andy McDonnell MP. To be invited by AR to come and speak, it's a, it's, a, it's a real joy, and thanks to the campaign as well uh, for this. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned that incredible session uh, of the Joint uh, Transport and Bursa Select Committee, Peter Hepplethwaite, if people remember, he, t he turned up and I challenged him about what he'd done to the p &O workers. And he was just absolutely incredible, because he, so he knowingly broke the law. Mm. Uh, and I did ask him, I said, do you, do you think it's perfectly all right to travel at 90 miles an hour down the motorway and do your own thing? And of course he didn't. But it, what was more important was the, the, the response from government which was, uh, so they were, what they weren't going to do to p and uh, they were going to, uh, unlimited fines were going to be meted out to them. Uh, Peter Hepplethwaite himself would have been barred from the, uh, from the register, never be a director again. Uh, you, with a little bit of time that passed, as you rightly say, Kyle, they thought, actually, it's a good idea. I think we'll use this when we come to smash uh, the, uh, the rail strikes. Um, so, you know, all of that hand-wringing uh, was for, for nothing. There still is the ability to look at this, uh, because in, in my view, we, we instructed the insolvency service to look at how they could be prosecuted. And if you remember the detail of it, they hadn't given notice uh, for these um, uh, 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 redundancies. And by virtue of not giving notice, they're, they're therefore in breach. If the law was in any way defective and you had, had the will to do it, you could have corrected any error that there may have been. And you could, should you so wish, impose an unlimited fine. It was completely within their gift. They chose not to. Uh, not only that, they then chose to engross the bequest to the parent company, uh, uh, DP World, for birth for at the, at the gateway um, Freeport in London, giving that company more taxpayers money. You couldn't make it up, it couldn't be more corrupt than it, than it is, but um, terrific to be here. He clearly knows nothing about negotiations and how they're conducted. It would be totally and utterly unworkable for either party uh, involved trying to get a, a dispute. But we've seen just how flimsy his grasp on wider economic matters is, given his disastrous so-called mini-budget. Uh, and announcements of billions of pounds of borrowing in order to hand over tax breaks to the wealthiest and managing to crash the pound to its lowest level in a matter of days. Uh, perhaps they're quite happy to see the pound hit, take such a hit and working people to pay the, uh, the price. It's a bit like, a, for me, it's like a, a drunk uh, uh, casino. They just absolutely smashed out of his mind at half past two in the morning, just, oh, we'll give it all a, a final roll of the dice. It's just unbelievable. But their right-wing Thatcherite ideology and contempt for working people was, was laid out in detail in that dreadful book, uh, Britannia Un Unchained. And it just remind you, they said that the UK has a bloated state, high taxes and excessive regulation. And they went on to complain firm saying that the British are among the worst idlers in the world. We work among the lowest hours. We retire early and productivity is poor. Whereas Indian children aspire to be doctors or businessmen. The British are more interested in football and pop music. And that was Patel, uh, Coate, <clears throat> Rob, they all signed up to, uh, uh, to this and of course Liz Truss herself. Um, utterly disgraceful. These people should be nowhere near the reins of government. But thanks to the swivel-eyed Tory membership, Liz Truss and her cronies have made their way to Downing Street on the back of receiving a mandate from 
of eligible voters. Now just think about that. This, I mean, it wouldn't meet the threshold that they've set for union members voting on strike action. It's almost as if we're living through the last stages of a dying administration right now, whose leaders are only intent on ransacking the country and rewarding their mates in the city during the time they have left before they are kicked out of office. The very idea that tax cuts for the wealthiest in our society will stimulate investment and growth has extremely little backing from any respected authority, like apart from the Daily Mail and the Daily Express, I suppose. But in a period of economic crisis, there's, a, there's massive evidence that investment falls because there's no confidence that this so-called gamble will pay off. And of course, let's remember, it's not a gamble for the rich. Um, they'll do extremely well out of this package, but the working class, ordinary people, the low paid and those who've been marginalised are going to be hammered. And it's clear that Kwarteng has one agenda and one agenda only, making the richest even richer at the expense of the rest of us. We know that we're one of the most unequal countries in Europe. We have pockets of incredible wealth alongside shameful levels of poverty and marginalisation. Even before the price of energy skyrocketed, one in six working households were living below the poverty line and that's going to get worse. In my town of Middlesbrough, um, over the past five years alone, the relative child poverty levels have almost doubled and two out of five children in my town now live in households with an income below the poverty line. I, it breaks my heart when I go out into my community and I knock on doors and talk to people and I get a mum coming to the door and she's got children there and there isn't a stick of furniture in the house. There are bare boards and they've got nothing to eat in, in our country at this time. You come away in tears and they ignore you. Here's 20 quid, at least go and get the kids something to eat. That's what we've got to in our land. And if we're really serious about improving the lot for working people, we've got to have a plan. We've got to have a plan for delivery. And the labour movement does. To start with, we need to give working people a pay rise. And I don't mean cutting the top rate of tax of removing or removing the cap on bankers' bonuses. I mean immediately raising the minimum wage to £15 an hour. But that's just the beginning. And as this event, the title of it says, now's the time for a new deal for workers. And when I was uh, employment rights spokesperson until last year, I was honoured to chair the Power in the Workplace Task Force. And we worked with trade union colleagues alongside terrific input by John Hendy. And of course, I've got to pay credit to the input through the side door, Keith Ewing as well, um, because that was absolutely invaluable, that unsurpassed uh, fountain of knowledge and all things to do with employment rights. And we led to the production of our paper, A New Deal for Working People. Uh, and of course, I was able to do that because of the work of so many people who went before me, uh, one of whom is in our audience tonight, Laura Pidcock, because she did so much uh, to progress this agenda and I was able to carry it on. Uh, but the, the paper itself was accepted as party policy at last year's conference and I'm glad to see that Usdor now produced a, a condensed version of it. It's, uh, there's the big one and then they've got a little pocket one which are, are pretty uh, darn good does. I don't know whether, I think Ellie's got a copy of uh, the map certainly rifled a few from us, though. Um, so it's been ac accepted, um, but let's just have a moment about what it actually does, because it creates a single status of workers and puts an end to all the variations thereon, including all the bogus self-employment, and gives workers day one rights on the job. It strengthens the rights of the employed and self-employed, letting working people have a secure, stable income upon which to build a good life. I think Kia had that right today. You know, it's not that you just you don't, you, you want more to get back, you need to be able to have a life, uh, and we want people to have good and flourishing lives. It bans zero-hour contracts, um, so that any Labour politicians really any doubt about it, they're banned, uh, and outlaws the tactics of fire and rehire, upon which Barry Gardner did such a sterling job with his private members bill as well as making a right to work flexibly and to switch off. Delivers a social security system that provides a safety net with decent sick pay. Using public procurement 
for supporting good work as a wonderful Welsh Labour government under Mark Drakeford, Drakeford are doing in Cardiff and last but not least would establish fair pay agreements recognised at law producing a flaw of conditions across industries and uh, 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 sectors. Um, and I noted the commitment the other day by West Streeting not only to a national care service but to a fair pay agreement for that very sector mm -hmm. that so badly needs it and I so welcome that. The level of exploitation and maltreatment of those who look after the elderly uh, and the, those most in need speaks volumes about the state of Tory Britain and should shame us as a nation. Colleagues, there's a great deal to do, but to achieve any of this, we need, above all, to repeal the pernicious trade union legislation and let our trade unions do their job and bargain for members. Um, that, all of this needs to be maintained. There's been a commitment made by the party that I'm so grateful for. It's quite a relief to hear that speech, to hear so much of the manifesto of not only 2017, but of 2019 sustained. If you want to relabel stuff, I don't care, <laughs> as long as you do it. Um, and I think we've got to keep people honest to those commitments. Um, but Kwarteng's anti-trade union broadside on Friday should worry each and every one of us and we'll have to fight his plans tooth and nail. We either continue with the status quo of privatisation, exploitation and extraction of value, which will only extend the cost of living crisis, or we can take a different path, a path that will bring to an end the scourge of poverty and truly deliver for our people. It's a Labour government's duty to deliver on this. It is the moral purpose of our party and what we were founded to fight. And I get it that Keir announces the Labour Party is the political wing of the British people. But never let that disguise the, our origins and our roots, that the Labour Party and our trade unions are as one. We are one singular movement. And it's only trade unions that are going to be able to stand up and fight for people collectively. I was just finished with this chair because when I was in the shadow cabinet um, we were asked uh, how the, or a certain member asked how these uh, issues might be better communicated to the electorate uh, and the brilliant Michael Marmot, the author of those scathing reports, he said with such clarity to the shadow cabinet, tell the truth about what's gone wrong and be bold about how to fix it. In these dark and difficult times, as our government looks intent on turning the clock back 50 years, back to Pentagon, when trade unions were imprisoned for fighting for justice in the workplace, more than ever, we must struggle on together until that all of our demands are met. Thank you. Yeah, it's 50 years since those five trade unionists were locked up in Pentonville Prison. And they'd refuse to stop picketing Keaton's container dam. Um, and in those days, it was the, the National Industrial Relations Court that was telling comrades not to go on picket lines. Um, this year, it's, it's somebody else telling people not to go on picket lines. Um, <coughs> But look where we are. We're in Liverpool here today, and just down the road, we've got a dog strike. A Liverpool dog. And in between, almost 30 years ago now, we had the Mersey Dogs and Harbour Company dispute. That was one of the longest running disputes in, in labour history at the time. It was three years, 95 to 98. Right? And I, I, I'm actually surprised that we're not meeting in the Casa Pub because that was where their redundancy settlements went to buy that as a community pub. I mean, quite honestly, coming up with this beautiful staircase and the poly... Kaz, I thought, you know, you, you, you'd gone into the House of Lords. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, the bullhead moose up there. Um, 
It's, 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 you know, it's not the casa, is it? It's not the casa. Not we the just casa. dashed from the casa. Yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> um, look, and we're here again, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, today. And, it, you know, many of you have, have either seen the documentary, and Hayden's here, Hayden Price, who, who was the producer and the director of that documentary, and give him a clap, because, you know... <laughs> an amazing piece of work and you know and give John and Keith and yourself a clap because you were the guys who actually wrote the blinking bill I didn't you know I'm just the mouthpiece for it um, and and the sort of PR man that goes around the country talking about it but so I don't I don't think I need to tell you what's been going on and Andy talked about the PM dispute and how disgusting that was and I actually, for the first time in 25 years in Parliament, I can honestly say that I saw Tory MPs look ashamed. Wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I did wow. actually see some Tory MPs look ashamed because they stood up there and, and, and the, the minister who got up, the transport minister who got up um, to make the statement about p and he, um, he was outraged. It, it, it was appalling that this had happened and, and how dare they treat workers in this way. And all of the Tory MPs who got up and were equally outraged. And yet you could tell by their body language that they knew that had they not filibustered out the bill, this would never have happened. Mm -hmm. Clause one. Mm -hmm. uh, John, John wrote it. Clause one of that bill would have made it impossible to do what they did. Because the cost of doing it would have been an unlimited fine. And so I, I don't need to tell you the mechanics of the bill. I don't need to tell you about fire and rehire. You know it. You've seen it. You've seen it in your workplaces. You've, you're the people who've been fighting it. Um, you're the people who've been picking up your comrades who've been subjected to it. I, what I want to do is, I want to tell you some of the stories that, that touched me as I went around the country. Um, and I think to, when we went up to Tesco in Livingston in Scotland, and the depot there is, I mean it's massive, absolutely huge depot in, in, in Livingston. And they send 40 ton lorries out all across the, the country. Um, and the workforce there, there are two guys, um, these were drivers, drivers of the lorries. And one of them said to me that he had been brought in in the morning and told <coughs> that uh, he was going to be fired and then rehired. And his, his mind was just all over the place. He'd worked there for 25 years, and he just he couldn't believe it. He was just summarily told that he was going to be fired. And he said, and then he was told, not that he should take the afternoon off and speak to his family and think about what was going on and think about signing the new contract and so on. He was told he had to get in his cab and drive to Elgin don't know how good your Scottish geography is, from Livingston to Elgin, in a snowstorm. A complete breach of health and safety regulations. And that guy was in no fit state to drive his own car home, never mind drive in a snowstorm, a 40-foot container lorry, up to Elgin. And one of the other guys there, he, he said, and um, he actually just broke down when he was talking about it because he talked about how he had to go back and tell his wife. And again, he worked there for more than 25 years. And his voice simply faltered. <clears throat> he said, it was just so, mm. and he broke down when he said the word humiliating humiliating and, and I think what's been most important in communicating 
is not the legislation. It's not how we need to change the law. It's how we see the complete lack of respect for human beings. And, and that's what the existing legislation is about. It's about treating people like dirt. Um, in fact, strangely enough, that's a quote from somebody else, um, one of the guys at uh, Rush Electrical. He said, we've just been treated like dirt. This is a guy who, um, a really brilliant engineer, electrical engineer, sent off all over the world to, to repair electrical engines, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, he was, he was literally sent all over the world to do this. And he was being told that it was £15,000 out of his salary. 15000 right? And he said it was a direct attack on his livelihood. And he said that he found out when he was sitting in his own home on the sofa with his son on his lap watching television and his phone pinged up with an email telling him he was going to be fired. Now, again, that's, that's not about the legislation, it's not about the law, it's about how human beings are being treated in this system. And as I've sort of gone round to CLPs and Tulo meetings and, and, and you know, regional meetings of, of, of unions, time and again, people have come up with their own stories, their own experience of, of this. And, you know, I think of, of um, uh, Hartsmere. And it was a woman in Hartsmere, and she... She didn't say anything the entire meeting. There was lots of questions after the after we'd done the screening of the documentary. Lots of questions, lots of you know talking about it. And then right at the end, this woman who was sitting at the back put up her hand and she said, "I didn't realise until I just watched your documentary. This happened to me." She didn't know. She thought it was standard practice. She just thought this was the way you could treat people in employment. <clears throat> And the irony was, um, she worked for a charity. She worked for a hospice. You know, people who are supposed to, to want to treat people decently, to do good things for people. And there she was being treated simply as a dispensable cog in the machine. And that's, that's why it's important to tell the story of these people. And that's why the documentary has been so valuable. And, and, and please, if, if your CLP hasn't yet invited us to come and show it, you know, or, or your local trade union liaison office or whatever, get us to come. Because the value of this, I think it really brings it home to people much more than just, this is unjust, this is, it's the humanity or the inhumanity of it that really speaks to people and gets them motivated to fight against this legislation. So let me now move to the parliamentary battle and, and, and you know, Kat, you, you talked about it and, and uh, Andy talked about it as well. Because you're right, just before um, the summer recess, the government put through those two statutory instruments and the first was just what, what do you call it bullying harassment intimidation it said to a union if you make a technical error even a technical error in your balloting procedure your strike procedure then the fine that you can be that can be levied against you goes from two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to one million. Now, what what's the purpose of that? The purpose of that is to say, if you as a union want to ballot for industrial action, you risk 
being put into liquidation. If you're a small if you're a medium sized unit. And it's that threat, that intimidation, that is behind what they were doing. And, and the other thing, of course, was the agency workers' camps, which you, 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 you mentioned. But, you know, the extraordinary thing was this. Um, the employment agencies who employ the agency workers, Hayes, Manpower, Deco, with the TUC, all wrote to the Secretary of State, and I quote, they said, we can only see these proposals in flaming strikes, not ending. This is not, this is, this is not about improving industrial relations. It's about inflaming them. And I, I went down to the Monica Trust. The, I don't know if you followed the strike that's been going on down there with the care workers. And they're pretty, I that met the guy last night um, who, who'd been with us when we'd gone there. Um, and he was telling me that, you know, they've been doing this now for several months. They're really wound down about it. Um, but he said, you know, all this time, they've been having to bring in agency workers. And there's only about 20% of the original staff still left there working in those care homes. And, and that's a huge strain on the regular workers because they actually do care about the residents. You know, agency workers will come in, they'll go out, they'll come in. They don't develop the same relationship. But these, these guys, the, the thing they were most worried about was the impact on the residents. Um, and what this does, having agency workers come in and, and, and take over, is it proves that the workers who are in dispute are right. The management can pay more because, of course, the agency workers are costing more than the original workers. And yet they've gone on paying them for months in this dispute. So it, it actually has proven the point that the agency, that, that, that the management can afford to do this. So those were the two things before the summer. And of course, you know, and Andy mentioned what's, uh, what happened last week. And we are simply seeing an ideological attack that is undermining workers' rights, undermining the strength of unions quite deliberately. <coughs> And I think we're at that point where we, we have to fight. And you said, Kaz, it's not going to happen in Parliament. It's, it's going to happen actually in the workforce with people simply demanding their rights. And that's what the Pentonville Five did. That's exactly what they did. They were prepared to go to prison to defend their rights. You know, that's why the Dockers went out for three years, 30 years ago, here in this city. Um, that's a damn tough thing to do. But always, the change that has come that has been progressive and positive has come because people have been prepared to fight for it and to suffer for it. And in Parliament, all we can do is listen to that voice, pass the legislation that's required, and thank God we've got people like John and yourself and Keith that can help us do the right legislation. And the leadership have now promised it will happen within 100 days of a Labour government. So let's hold them to it. You know, the asbestos exposures that, we're ex that workers are exposed to. They've got heart and respiratory diseases, cancers and other diseases. They die by suicide because of the work that they do. They die at sea, in air crashes, on the roads, in incidents that their employers didn't bother to control the risks. And because they're exposed to biological hazards like COVID. And during the pandemic, we've been shocked 
by the lack of intervention by the enforcement authorities in ensuring the health, safety and welfare of workers. And the toll on workers has been horrific and will continue to scar workers and their families. We are definitely not out of the crisis yet. Less than 46% of workplaces are trade union organised. And, the industrial, and as the industrial landscapes changed, an anti-trade union legislation has left a heavy toll on all workers. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the trade unions and the important role of safety reps throughout this pandemic, helping to keep workers safe. Long established TUC research says that workers are twice as safe in their, if they're in trade union organised workplaces. We believe that the issues exposed and exploited during the pandemic were wider than the occupational health and safety. And as records show, the rich have got richer and the poor have got sick. The pandemic didn't cause our occupational health crisis, it exposed it. It's been decades in the making, with resources slashed to the HSC, the health and safety executive, by more than 50%. A smaller inspector force than was needed and a deregulatory agenda that's left enforcement in tatters. Rory O'Neill, who writes the Hazards magazine, fantastic person, like, you know, does loads of research, and actually was, you know, really instrumental in the ILO fundamental rights uh, success earlier this year. He said that workers should not be disposable. Work should not be spirit sapping, body body breaking grind, and warned that bad jobs are driving us over the edge, and that it's time to turn and fight for basic decency, security and rights at work. And it isn't just our, our physical working environments that need improvement, but the way that our work is managed. Massive workloads, unrelenting pressures, working in inadequate facilities that are under-resourced, understaffed and impact detrimentally on our, our health and happiness. And for some people, the pressure is too much and the burden is too great to bear. Steve Toombs, an academic, with the Open University in his Better Regulation, Better For Whom, says business harms are routine, systemic, and crucially avoidable. They are a form of violence, so widespread, they've been called social murder because they put communities, consumers, and workers in a position that they inevitably meet in too early and unnatural death. Health and safety law is no longer fit for purpose. It's failing to hold workplaces to a precautionary standard. Health and safety at work is an equality and class issue. Generally, as your pay goes down, the risks that you're facing go up. Lower paid, less secure workers face more risks of being injured, made ill, being killed at work and dying from work illnesses, including all the major killers of heart lung disease, as I said before, and cancers and even more, and even the work related suicide. And they're less able to protect themselves or to complain even, to get their rights at work enforced, especially as most are not in trade unions. Health and safety abuses frequently overlap and interlink with other employment issues in complex ways. And the current health and safety system has been broken. To make work safer and healthier, we need to reclaim and reframe health and safety regulation as a basic human right, a social good. We love red tape. It's better than bloody bandages. We need to end this ideological deregulation, restore effective enforcement, remove all restrictions on trade unions to organise, educate and protect workers' lives and health. We believe it's essential that the HSC, local authority enforcement bodies are revamped as a powerful independent occupational health and safety preventative system with a governance and organisation that prioritises workers' health led by an explicit champion of workers' health and lives. We need to provide real enforceable employment and safety rights to ensure good health and safety in low paid precarious work. We want to see the evidence shared for the benefit of good regulation and enforcement and exposing the extent and cost of harm caused by bad work. Now that we're out of the EU, we have to ensure that the UK commit to the highest international standards of health and safety law and not in the race to the bottom on one that's got clear evidence that their working conditions have caused their mental ill health and anguish, which has led to suicide. We need to make sure, uh, we need to look at all the institutions to support health and safety, like using toxic use reduction methods. 
The HSC has abandoned workers and at the moment it's business first and workers last. It pays lip service to the fatalities, it doesn't prosecute if employers fail to report, it hasn't enforced the SRC regs, the safety reps and safety committee regulations ever. It's uh, or work related stress and employers are getting away with murder. Every year more than 650 workers die by suicide because of their workplaces. So for the betterment of society, we need decent jobs, decent lives, and a health and safety system fit for all workers. And as we say in the Hazards Movement, we remember with heartache our dead, but we will continue to fight like hell for the living. Thank you. campaign for inviting us it really is an honour uh, to be part of these platforms and essential essential that this is still brought up at meetings like this um, can I start with this um, this is Arthur he was one of the 95 miners who was arrested on the 18th of June um, Arthur said I've still got the scar from the busted head I had had a truncheon wheel a fractured skull I had to go back to the hospital, I was getting headaches and double vision. This was before the trial. I have terrible paranoia. It still feels like they're waiting to get us for something else because we challenged them and made them look stupid. I have these thoughts when I put the news on, <coughs> it will all start again. Arthur's wife said, we tried to get back to normal. It's never gone away, don't think it ever will. I remember my daughter Rebecca phoning me one day. It wasn't long ago. She'd found the dad in a state and had to get the doctor. The doctor came to the house and said he was suffering with trauma. That still carries on. These were statements taken from ex-minors and their families, which went into our legal submission. It was stories like that that Amber Rudd, when she was the Home Secretary, said, don't need an inquiry into Orgreen. There's been no miscarriages of justice. Nobody died. The police have got nothing new to learn and it's not in the public interest. Well, those are stories, you know, very, very directly, you know, stories of people directly involved, the stories that Barry was talking about, um, that, you know, just, just tell their own struggle that carries on now. Um, but there's another thing about Augury um, and the miners' strike, uh, which is vital to remember and never ever forget. Uh, and that's its relevance to where we are now. What is happening now was made possible because of how the Tories picked that fight, manipulated that fight, and left us with the world and the economy that we now have. So I am taking you back in time. <laughs> but, you know, it's important to remember how that dispute came about. Um, the trade unions in the 70s, you know, I'm not saying the uh, trade union legislation was wonderful then. Still anti-trade union legislation, but unions did have power. And in fact, it was the National Union of Mine Workers in 1972 and subsequently in 1974 that brought down the Tory government of the day. Heath went out to the uh, public, he called an early general election, said, who runs the country? Is it the National Union of Mine Workers? Isn't it the Tory government? And people voted and said, well, it's not the Tory government, we've got a Labour government. But the Tories didn't forget. Um, and they didn't put their heads down either. They just started planning, planning for when the next general election, which we know was the 79 one, and we know what happened then. They planned by looking at how they could get the economy into how they wanted to run it. Thatcher was a huge, huge fan of Pinochet and that trickle-down, neoliberal, free market enterprise, um, and that's what they wanted to do here. But the 45 Labour government had nationalised our public services, had nationalised our key industries of energy and communication, and those nationalised industries were unionised, strong unionised. And if you're going to take them back, and if you're going to sell them off to your mates, you've got to get rid 
of that powerful organised labour force. And to do that, that's when I say they picked a fight and they planned for it. Um, they started with a document called the Ridley Plan. <coughs> Look it up if you haven't heard about it. Um, a, a, a very far-right group of MPs, led by Nicholas Ridley, pulled together a plan for how to deal um, and push a union um, when they took industrial action. Everything from planning a paramilitary-style police force to working out how you break a strike by bringing in scab workers. Everything was in that plan. It was like a blueprint for what happened during the strike. And Orgreave itself, well, the strike was going well. Three months into the strike, the miners were getting through to miners in other areas, Nottinghamshire in particular, being able to talk to the workers there, um, and it was going well. And so what started to happen was an agreement that had been made regarding the movement of coke from the Orgreave Coke and Plant, uh, just outside Sheffield, to keep the steelworks at Scunthorpe going, an agreement was made with the union um, and, and, and that, that government that that could happen, but the government broke that promise. The, tra the, the train, the rail unions refused to move one piece of coal, and that's when they go, OK, Ridley Plan Action 1, mm -hmm. let's get the scab lorry drivers in to move it. What had also happened, um, and I'll come to this twice, hopefully, not more than twice, but it is a bit of a pet thing of mine, which is the manual. When I talked about paramilitary style policing, this didn't just happen overnight. But what is scandalous about it is that most MPs sitting in Westminster knew nothing about this new manual of policing. It was put together by the Association of Chief Police Officers, ACPO for short. Um, very high up people in the government knew about it, but not everybody in the Home Office knew about it. And basically, in that manual, you had got how you did put into force um, riot police um, armed with long shields, short shields, long batons, short batons, mounted police with batons um, and dogs, and how you could choose and, and manage an area. Uh, to be able to contain. Um, we know, and hopefully you've seen, if not, there's plenty of footage, check it out on, uh, on the internet. Um, but basically, after you've got a, a row of police officers with long shields, and after a bit of a push, and you know, nothing bad, it was known as a ritual push, nothing violent. But basically what happened then is the long shielded police officers parted, and that's when the horses came through. Now, what would you do? You start to run. You're running for your life. Any miner who was at Orgreave, he says, if you were there and you weren't terrified, you were lying. Because it was absolutely horrific. And following that cavalry charge, you then got for the first time, first time, the use of the short shield police officers with batons. Short round shield and a baton in this hand. You come in with a shield, you're running after people. What is that baton for? Excuse me, I'm going to caution you, tell you you're under arrest. No, no. That's, you know, that is what happened. Um, it wasn't just one day of violence and it wasn't just one place, but that was a pivotal moment. Um, and we have to uh, remember that. Um, I do want to touch on, you know, what we have to remember as well about the past is that this wasn't just a government doing this for their own political <coughs> ideology. They've got friends, friends who back them up and who still back them up. I'm talking about the mainstream media. Now, we know, we know the scum that they are. Um, we know that, you know, one print wanted to publish this. I don't know if you can see that picture of Arthur Scargill who was waving at somebody but they tried to portray it as him doing a Nazi salute. Didn't get printed because the print unions printed a refusal to print it on the front page. The BBC, no better, I'm sorry, but they were no better than the mainstream press. I'm sure you're aware that they uh, reversed the footage, can you believe this? Or even saying this? 
Um, what annoys me about it is that not only did they do that, um, you know, and that resonated and that stuck in people's minds, this idea, this false impression that the miners were the violent ones. But the day after, the day after all grief, on the 19th of June 1984, the Assistant Director General, Alan Brothero, had said that he had a feeling that the BBC's evening coverage of all grief, quote, might not have been wholly impartial. That was the day after. That was the day after. And they asked for a report to be done, uh, a report intended for internal purposes. That report is now published, we have it. And at a meeting on Broadcasting House on the 30th of April, 1985, that date's important because it's before the trial, the trial that Arthur was one of the minors. It was before that happened on the 30th of April, 85, that same director, assistant director general said he felt haunted by the contrast of the BBC's presentation and other footage that have since come to light. Now this is going back 38, 37 years. A trial still happened. What did the media fail to do? There was no big splash in the press that all of the miners were acquitted. Then evidence was pulled apart. It was fabricated, it was untruthful. Let's face it, you know, there is a name for that when you do that in a courtroom. Nobody was brought to account about it, and that's what we've never had with all grief. No accountability whatsoever. It gave the police impunity to behave in the way that they did. They knew they'd got their backs covered. Uh, they weren't acting on their own. This wasn't a few rogue police officers who just decided to have a bit of a rout. You know, this, they knew that they'd got their backs covered. Um, so... <laughs> We ne must never forget, never forget what happened. And what's important about you know, our campaign, we carry on fighting for a public inquiry. We were delighted that eventually the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership did make it Labour Party policy. And we are told it remains Labour Party policy, uh, which is brilliant that we will get an inquiry. Um, but you know what, what we have to, remember is that in the fight to get that there is still so many people who just do not know this happened and yet and yet people that didn't know about this didn't know the extent to just how evil and nasty the Tories are and just the extent they will go to to look at after themselves and their own class people don't know this and yet they're suffering the same now so we've tried to reach out to younger people um to to make it clear that their struggles are exactly the same as what happened all those years ago and our fight for justice because it's not just to right that wrong of what happened to those people it's to shine a light on it all mm -hmm. and that is why you know i hope you can follow our campaign invite us to any meetings you're having um, it's also relevant to what is happening today, but when you get that message out, there's nothing better is there. Have you seen the film Pride? That amazing scene when Di Donovan from Wales says, there's nothing better than knowing that you've got a friend that you never knew you had. You know, and we've got to remember that. It's, it's bloody hard being an activist. And it's hard fighting for injustice that is so old. And our campaign has been going 10 years this year. Um, it's bloody hard, but it is so nice to know you've got a friend out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kev. Ni 1972 was a momentous year for the trade union and labour movement. The uh, Upper Clyde shipbuilders working had just succeeded in uh, securing government contracts. In February, the miners' strike, which Chris mentioned, and the Battle of Saltley Gate has succeeded in securing a wage rise for the miners. In July, the dockers locked up in Pentonville for contempt of court were freed after a spontaneous mass strike and the threat of a general strike called by the uh, TUC. It meant the end of the Industrial Relations Act of 1979, which as Chris mentioned, 
was ultimately repealed in 1974. There was the Trico strike, the bright colour working, and a whole number of other disputes which were uh, successes for the Labour movement. But the Tory government took its revenge. This month, 50 years ago, construction workers picketed a building site in Shrewsbury. For that, they were imprisoned, and it's taken 50 years to this year before they secured a pardon. I would like to pay my respects to Eileen Turnbull and the campaign to uh, secure justice for the Shrewsbury pickets. And by the way, I'm... I'm Amongst the other things that I do, I'm counsel for the trade unions on the undercover policing inquiry. And do you know we discovered documents in that inquiry which showed that the campaign to free the Shrewsbury dockers had been uh, under surveillance by an undercover police officer who was reporting to headquarters and uh, I think to the security security services. What justification could there possibly be for an undercover police officer infiltrating the campaign to free the Shrewsbury uh, dockers? Uh, anyway, I mustn't digress. The, that incident reminds us of what Chris has been saying uh, to us, the ruthlessness of the ruling uh, elite. And we've seen it, seen it evidenced many times since at Grunwick, in the miners' strike, in the medieval cavalry charge at Orgreave, and of course in the endless stream of anti union legislation that we've had to put up with since 1980. And again, I mustn't, dis I mustn't digress, Cat, but I've just got to say about these last uh, two proposals from Quasi uh, Quarte uh, la last week. Well, one is that there's minimum service uh, requirements in, in certain strikes. And the other one is that they've got the ballot whenever a, an offer is made by an employer. Now just think what that means. You've got to carry out a ballot in order to have a strike in the first place. That ballot has got to be conducted by post. That means the union has to send out by post the ballot papers with stamped addressed envelopes in them and the members have to send that back again. Now it takes weeks to organise a strike, even a small strike for a union. Are the government really saying that every time after the strike has been balloted for, any offer by the employer has then got to be subject to the same process of the union having to expend its resources sending out ballot papers to the members in order to see what their view is of the offer that's made. I mean, this is just absolutely fatuous. And of course, the government can't say, oh, well, don't worry about that, a show of hands will do. Because then, of course, the unions will say, well, a show of hands will uh, legitimate the strike in the first... Oh, I mustn't digress. Look, uh, I, and, and just before I leave the, this ruthlessness, to use Chris's word, Having read the leaked report, the Ford report, and watched the Al Jazeera programme, I must say I'm not uh, altogether convinced that the Labour Party in power will be any less ruthless uh, against its enemies in the Labour movement than the Tories have been. But we'll see. Now, the 1970s, in fact, was a great decade. It was the most equal in British history in terms of the disposition of the wealth and income of the country. Never before have working people secured a greater slice of the gross domestic product than in the uh, years of the 1970s. And I just would like to remind the audience, if I may, of how that was achieved, it, because it's relevant to our situation today. It was achieved by collective bargaining. In 1970, 78% of our workforce had the benefits 
of a collective agreement. 78% of all workers were covered by a collective uh, agreement of one kind or another. By 1972, our reference year, over 80% of workers was covered. By 1975, collective bargaining coverage had peaked at 85% of our workers. And that is one of the highest levels of collective bargaining in, in Europe. There are still countries with much higher rates of collective bargaining coverage in Europe, but we were doing well. With Thatcher's election in 1979 and the introduction of neoliberalism as a dogma for government, where trade unions and collective bargaining are regarded as a distortion of the labour market, collective bargaining had to be destroyed. And that's what that government set about doing. Let me just list the techniques that they used in order to destroy collective bargaining. Of course, the anti-union laws that Andy mentioned, and in particular, the absolute prohibition on all forms of secondary action. They abolished the wages councils. They revoked the fair wage Res resolution of the House of Commons. They repealed the legislation extending collective agreements to employers who were not parties to them. They removed the duty to promote collective bargaining from ACAS. They endorsed and promoted a policy of de-recognition both sect at sectoral and enterprise level. In the public sector, they encouraged privatisation and outsourcing. In the private sector, fragmentation of employers and outsourcing achieved the same level of destroying uh, collective uh, uh, agreements. And of course, the failure of the government, or perhaps it was the success of the Tory government, in uh, exporting industries to cheap labour economies, shipbuilding, coal production, steel, iron and so forth, uh, meant that industries that had been formerly been highly organised with high levels of collective agreements uh, went out of the uh, country. The result was a slide in collective bargaining coverage which was not halted when the uh, Labour government introduced the recognition procedure in 2000. The result today, doing the best we can on the figures, the latest survey was 2019, which showed that collective bargaining had fallen to 26.9% of the workforce. Now we can estimate that it's probably about 23% of the workforce. That's less than one in four of all workers who have the benefit of a collective bargaining. And on pay bargaining, that's to say bargaining over wages, in fact, the percentage is lower still, because you have to remember that the public sector, in, in the public sector, although there's collective bargaining, they don't bargain collectively over pay. That's set either by government diktat, wage freeze, or an, an announcement, or by, uh, by uh, um, pay review bodies. So what we're talking about is the great mass of the work, workers of this country are at the mercy of the labour market. The generosity, or lack of it, of employers. Wages are set by diktat of employers on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. So when we see this great and inspiring wave of industrial action across so many uh, industries, we need to bear in mind that we are only talking about a small proportion of the workforce who are represented, representing, in fact, the entire working class. Because most workers are simply not in the position to take industrial action to defend their wages and conditions. I must make that point again. It's not a question that these workers in the, uh, in the uh, uh, conducting industrial action are looking for wage increases to improve the standard of their uh, uh, life. They are fighting to defend against wage cuts which are reducing the standard of life for uh, those uh, people. 
Now, because of that analysis of the destruction of collective bargaining and the effect that it's, we know that it's had in the decline of living standards, even before this cost of living crisis, even before the pandemic, the great increase in inequality and so on, we, we know that the answer to it is the restoration of collective bargaining coverage. And that's why this uh, employment rights paper, New Deal for Working People, puts at its heart the restoration of sectoral collective bargaining, or as it's described in the paper, fair pay uh, uh, agreements. So we know what uh, is needed to be done, but in order to get there, of course, this is not a fight over legislation, uh, and it's not a fight to be conducted by uh, lawyers. We need to extend trade unionism deeper and wider into the working class. We need to link up with all the campaigns fighting the class war that the elite have declared uh, against us. This is not a fight which elderly lawyers can contribute very much to. But it is a fight, at least for our children, and so solidarity and community are the ways in which we can win. Thank you.